Marcella Alston is a professor of public policy at Harvard Kennedy School. She received a BA from Harvard University, a master's in public health from Harvard School of Public Health, an MD from Loyola, Loyola University, and a PhD in economics from Harvard University. She trained at Brigham and Women's Hospital Hyatt Global Health Equity Residency Fellowship, then combined the B PhD with an infectious disease fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital. Prior to returning to Harvard, she was on faculty at Stanford. Thank you so much for taking some time to join us today for this important topic. Over to you. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Stephanie Stancheva, who's uh, a professor of economics at Harvard, uh, David Yang, who's an assistant professor of economics at Harvard, and then uh, two students who are currently transitioning to a faculty position in Munich, Luca Borgeri, Sarah Eckmeyer, and uh, a research assistant, Joyce Kim. So civil liberties include the right to self-determination, the right to privacy, free movement, free speech, worship, and procedural fairness. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, they are those that were edified in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, in the 1960s and 70s. This paper deals with trade-offs between civil liberties and health in times of crisis. So when societies confront a crisis that jeopardizes public welfare and safety more broadly, temporarily curtailing civil liberties may be part of the policy response. But as history has shown, sometimes this becomes a pretext for eroding rights in the long run. And this is, of course, uh, we're thinking about this in the context of the pandemic, but this has also occurred after terrorist attacks, um, after devastating natural disasters, and of course, uh, after um, when we're in COVID. So during the 1918 influenza pandemic, uh, almost a century ago, there were lots of different measures that were taken, some of which will seem very similar to what we're seeing now with closures of businesses and places of worship, um, measures to prevent crowds and exhortations to vote despite the potential health risks. And again, these measures don't seem too dissimilar to some of the ones that we're taking today. And there's a lot of discussion about the right balance in terms of restrictions of civil liberties and what types of policy responses that the public and the policymakers will accept. Then as in now in 1918, there was uh, some resistance to some of the ordinances. For example, in 1918, there was an anti-mask movement which actually succeeded in reversing the mask mandate in the city of San Francisco. And we've seen here in the United States, uh, vocal opposition, protests, and lawsuits in response to some of the measures that have been taken. So in this paper, we want to study in real time how citizens trade off civil liberties and health during one of the largest crises in recent history. And in particular, we want to understand how citizens view this fund fundamental trade-off and what are citizens willing to sacrifice and what are they steadfast in supporting no matter what? And we want to understand how these trade-offs vary across geographies, namely national boundaries, as well as with personal characteristics. And we finally want to look at what shapes these preferences. And what we'll find time and time again is that when people are at personal health risk, this is when people seem to be willing to trade off the most. To make progress on this question, we're going to leverage large-scale large surveys spanning 12 countries, and we'll use both natural and experimental variation in order to try and make progress. So our outline for the talk is as follows. First, I'll tell you a bit about the data and the survey we constructed, mm -hmm. as well as survey we leveraged. 
Uh, then I'll describe uh, some of the geographic and demographic factors that correlate with willingness to trade off civil liberties. Next, I'll look at the relationship between health risk specifically and civil liberties, both with quasi-experimental and experimental findings. And then, uh, then we'll look at the evolution of these trade-offs over time. Okay, turning to the surveys. So we ran a large scale cross country survey on civil liberties trade-offs, which was a representative sample of about 16,000 individuals from seven countries. These countries included the United States, the United Kingdom, Italy, France, Germany, South Korea, and China. And we were in the field between March 30th and April 18th of this year. The samples were representative of country characteristics on gender, age, and income. And we pre-specified to oversample what were then the hot spots within each country. So 80% was geographically representative and 20% were from the hot spots. Our aim was to select countries at different stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it, the epidemic was waning at least temporarily in China and in South Korea. We were in the field during the peak of the epidemic for Italy, France, and Germany, or the peak of the first wave at least. And we were slightly before the peak of the epidemic in the US and the UK. These countries also varied in terms of their governance style and in terms of their individualism. Um, so you can see here that we have China and South Korea, which score very low on an individualism scale, whereas the US and the UK score very high. And that might be important for willingness to uh, trade off civil liberties or participate in things that are for the public health good. We also have various differences in terms of the governance style. And then the hot spots here, um, you can see the populations. In the US and Italy, there was more than one city that uh, constituted a hot spot, which was generally defined as a place where the highest um, proportion of deaths were located. So in addition to that survey, which we call our civil liberties instrument, our civil liberties health and economic risks survey, we also have been fortunate to have a relationship with a survey vendor, the same one that carried out our large scale survey. And they have an ongoing global consumer trends report, which they ask weekly to a thousand participants in uh, several different countries, 12 countries, including Australia, Canada, France, Germany, India, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Singapore, Spain, the UK, and the US. So it's nice that there is some overlap in terms of the countries, but then there's certainly an expansion as well. And to this ongoing consumer trends report, we've been able to append our core trade-off questions on civil liberties. And this is going to be very useful when we, uh, when we talk about dynamics, since this survey is a repeated cross-section that runs every week and is still ongoing. So the core trade-off questions that's both in the survey, the civil liberties instrument, as well as the global consumer trends ongoing cross-sectional survey is as follows. On a scale of zero to 10, to what extent do you agree with the following statement? And then it was, I am willing to insert one of these uh, domains of civil liberties. I'm willing to sacrifice, for example, my own rights and freedoms during a crisis like the current one for the health and well-being of society. So they all have this generic form and they all uh, try to probe different sets of rights. So generic rights um, my, on my own self or on others. And then we had specific questions about privacy restrictions, suspending democratic procedures, control of the media. And as a benchmark, we also included willingness to endure economic losses. In addition, we had the sort of canonical live saved questions. 
So this was only included in the main survey instrument, in the civil liberties instrument. Uh, there was not room for it on the Global Consumer Trends Report. And the preamble for that question was, out of every 100 people who would have otherwise died in your country because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some will be saved if one of the following policies will be implemented. What is the minimum number of lives that each of the following policies would need to save in order for you to support it? So we tried to make this very salient. We emphasize that these would be citizens of your own country. We tried to correct for different priors as to how deadly the epidemic was by putting out of every 100 people who would have otherwise died, though we also correct for priors when we when we actually analyze this question. And we tried to make it very transparent that if you said a low minimum needed to be saved in order for you to support, support the policy, that therefore was an extremely desirable policy. Whereas if you said a very high minimum number, that would be an extremely undesirable policy. And as the, as the participant moved the slider, this sentence down here would fill in. For me to support this policy, it would have to save at least X number of lives out of every 100. So that was the preamble. And then the different, privacy, the different policies we gave them, generically, we tried to include two versions, a looser version and a stricter version. So for example, for privacy, one iteration was uh, what's the minimum lives needed to be saved for you to allow the government to track smartphone locations and social contact data of citizens who have tested positive for COVID-19 versus a more stringent condition, which would be to track smartphone location and social contact data of all citizens. Um, we had restrictions on movement, such as closing the national border, um, this was the sort of lighter version, recommend citizens do not leave their home except for limited permitted reasons. And then this was the, the more strict condition, which would be arrest citizens who are outside the home if they don't have government per permission. And these, um, this type of variation allowed us to kind of make, make sure that our data were making sense. Generally, uh, the minimum lives needed to be saved were higher when the policy was more strict. Um, so arrests had an, a higher minimum than just recommend the citizens. We also looked at support for closures and uh, for trading off uh, public health measures for different types of economic pain. Doubling the unemployment rate, tripling the unemployment rate, again, we would expect and we do see that uh, the mean minimum is higher for tripling and something about inequality, cutting the pay of low-income workers in half. We had a quote-unquote hard outcome, which was um, interest in downloading a, a tracking app. So obviously there have been several apps now that have been developed to, to track people um, and, and record symptoms. Um, symptoms Monitor, MIT has developed such an app. And we asked if they were interested in finding more about it, um, bringing them to the links to the app's website, et cetera. Okay, uh, now we'll move into some summary statistics. So basically this shows you uh, how much of our sample is from these different locations. And you can see that overall the mean age is about 44, 45 in the two instruments, uh, approximately half female. 10% um, unemployed in our instrument, 7% um, in the global consumer trends. But these uh, unemployment rates, I should say, are measured prior really to the, um, uh, the height of the pandemic. Um, and then uh, we, this is a number that's still counting. So this number is fixed. This number, I believe, is closer to 200,000 now um, as we continue to collect data. Okay. So here is uh, the first graphic, again, purely descriptive, just kind of ranking countries in terms of uh, their mean willingness to, to uh, sacrifice their own rights in order to protect the health and well-being of the entire society. Um, this dashed line here represents uh, the United States. So, and uh, this is dichotomized, so we made it into a zero-one variable, 
people that said they were willing or, or more willing or extremely willing are, are given a one. People that were unwilling, extremely unwilling, were given a zero. So we can look at proportions of people that are willing um, on average to sacrifice their rights. And so here we can see in China, it's you know over 80% of the uh, citizens we surveyed are willing to sacrifice their life rights um, to protect the health and well-being of society. It's also, interestingly, the second highest uh, is Italy. And of course, they were at the height of a very aggressive um, epidemic at the time that we were in the field. Uh, then India, Great Britain, Canada, and then you can see the United States is really pretty far down here. Only um, the, the lowest fraction uh, actually is in Japan. And that pattern uh, is fairly similar. So not all of the questions were able to be asked in China. Suspend democratic procedures uh, really kind of doesn't have a lot of uh, meaningful content in China. But for most of the other ones, you see this pretty stark contrast, particularly between China and the United States. Um, and again, Italy tends to come out uh, pretty close to, uh, to the top here in terms of willingness to sacrifice overall rights. This is an average of all four. India also, interestingly, uh, scores pretty high on these measures of willingness to trade things off. And, uh, and it doesn't always accord that there is some overlap, some correlation between willingness to endure economic losses and willingness to trade off rights. But you can see that Italy is far less willing to endure economic losses than they are, say, uh, uh, relaxing privacy protections. It's also interesting, given the pretext, if people have been following the news about some of the uh, lawsuits in, in the EU surrounding um, privacy and, and wanting tech companies to to um, protect privacy, and yet here we see, you know, Great Britain and and Spain and Italy, all and France, even all kind of be more willing to relax privacy protections than in the United States, for example. So there are these substantial differences, um, and there could be many different reasons. Obviously, we wanted to sample countries that had different institutions at baseline. Um, they were in different stages of the pandemic, and there were also differences in the government response to the pandemic. Um, and we're going to investigate this a little bit more, drill down within country and look at different characteristics of individuals at the individual level. Um, so in this, uh, in this, uh, this graph is plotting the coefficients for all of these different characteristics. Um, interestingly, what we see is that young people are less willing to sacrifice rights. Men compared to women are less willing. So women are more willing, meaning that men are less willing. And the unemployed are actually less willing to sacrifice their rights than the employed. And I'm not sure how many slides I will have on this in this talk, but I can tell you that when we look at overall willingness to sacrifice rights in general, um, we see a strong heterogeneous response in that those who have less education and lower income overall um, tend to be less willing to sacrifice uh, rights for, and minority groups as well, which is very, very interesting. Out of the labor force covers a lot of retired groups and students, so hard to know what how, how they're doing sort of from a socioeconomic perspective. Um, so when we look at unemployed, again, across all these different measures, we, set, we see that they tend to lie to the left of the zero, meaning that they are overall less willing um, and women, again, more willing. And this is across all countries. Uh, when we look at our own survey instrument, this was using the Global Consumer Trends Survey. Uh, again, here we've kind of flipped it and put men instead of women. You can see that, again, men uh, less, less willing. Um, people who say they mistrust the media, uh, African Americans in the United States, less willing to trade off rights. Lower income, uh, slightly less willing to trade off rights. Um, but here, those who think that they are at high risk of contracting COVID um, are more willing, so this tends to be the most rightmost point in these graphics. So the health risk uh, really introduces some elasticity over 
these preferences. Uh, and indeed, when we look at in the data from the Global Consumer Trends Report, again, these are just correlations here, but we, there are questions about how worried you are about COVID for your own health and then for your household's financial position and how worried are you that civil liberties will erode and maybe not be restored. And when we look at those um, three different coefficients, uh, we see that individuals who are worried about their own health are extremely willing to sacrifice their own rights, suspend democratic procedures all the down the line. Uh, people that are worried about the economic impact of COVID, actually it doesn't have a strong correlation with willingness to sacrifice civil liberties. That's probably because there are some people who at this point in time might have thought that strong you know, public health measures could protect the economy and some who thought that public health measures were hurting the economy, that could all wash out maybe to a zero. Um, and then consistently people who are worried about the erosion of civil liberties in the long run are less willing to give them up in the short run. So that's a pretty sensible pattern that we see there. Okay, so based on what we've seen to date with those who are most willing uh, to give up civil liberties being, uh, being those who felt that there was some sort of health risk um, involved, we wanted to try and drill down a little bit and, and see if we could say something causal. So here what we're going to do is uh, we're going to develop uh, a health risk measure based on detailed questions we asked in our own survey instrument about people's pre-existing conditions and interact that with the risk associated with where they live. So we have this kind of difference in differences measure, if you will, of being in a given location and have these certain underlying risk conditions, which turned out to actually um, potentially uh, be associated with higher risk of death, conditional on contracting, contracting COVID. Um, that, will, that will allow us to say something that is, is more uh, causal in nature. So remember that we oversampled hotspot areas, um, and those were listed here, Bergamo and Milan in Italy, in uh, the United States, New York and Seattle, and China, Wuhan, and Korea, Daegu, in France, Paris, in the UK, London, and in Germany, Munich. And then we predicted there was a COVID tool that was developed by Mathematica, um, which predicted the health risks associated with uh, COVID-19 based on age, gender, and pre-existing conditions. And so you have your, your risk of death conditional on contracting the disease, and then you multiply that by your risk of contracting the disease, which has something to do with mostly endogenous behaviors. Um, so we don't use own behaviors for this uh, index. We try and make it more exogenous by using leave one out behaviors associated with your age group sex and country controlling linearly for your own behaviors in a regression. So this is this uh, health risk measure is a nonlinear combination of these different, uh, different features and they're put together, if you will, the function is taken from Mathematica. So we have this health risk score, uh, which we then interact with being in a hot spot area. Um, and we control again for all of the linear things that go into this score, since it's a nonlinear function, as well as the main effects of the score and hotspot. Uh, we also have country fixed effects, state fixed effects, uh, urban controls such as population density, and then lots of individual level controls, risk and time preferences, et cetera. So our coefficient of interest here is going to be this quote unquote difference and differences coefficient being at high risk uh, based on this Mathematica score and living in a high risk area. And in order for us to be identified, we need this condition that there really are no unobservables um, that both correlate with this interaction and affect our outcome of interest. Um, intuitively, what are we doing here? We are comparing those who are at higher risk within and outside of hotspot locations. So that in the absence of COVID, we would have the same elasticity with respect to trading off rights as those outside the hospital. Okay, so what do we see? Here is the table. Here are our different rights, our different 
uh, trade-offs up here, um, endure economic losses is our benchmark. All of our outcomes are on a zero to 10 Likert score with zero being completely disagree and 10 being completely agree. And we've also put as a reference here, the gap between the United States and China. Remember those were pretty much at the polar ends with China being most willing and the US being one of the least willing uh, to sacrifice rights. And what we find overall is that a one standard deviation unit increase in our health risk score here is associated with a 0.22 higher willingness to give up your own rights for residents that are inside hotspots. So that is coming from this coefficient here and we can benchmark it by looking at how much of the gap between China and US is closed by just being one standard deviation higher in terms of your health risk and living in a hotspot. And we see, for example, for this outcome of sacrificing your own rights, that closes about 23% of the gap between US and China um, in terms of their, their views on willingness to sacrifice rights. And um, that pretty much something around 20, 10 to 20% of the gap is uh, when we're able to measure it. Recall we didn't always ask these questions in China because they, they didn't have a lot of meaning. Um, but that's, that's pretty similar across the board. So that's suggestive evidence that people are willing to trade off um, during this huge crisis. Uh, they're willing to trade off their, their civil liberties, particularly when it comes uh, to personal health risk and that it can, actually, uh, it can actually even span some of the current gap uh, that might be ideologically based between the United States and China. And it contradicts the notion that there are these taboo trade-offs um, that, you know, even, that there are such fundamental rights that people are not willing to give them up no matter what. In fact, there is an elasticity. But obviously this pandemic uh, was more than just a health risk. There were lots of other things going on. And in order to drill down even Farther, we want to uh, introduce some experimental variation, which I will discuss next. Now, one thing I, I do want to say here that I, again, uh, we don't have, we didn't include all of the slides, but when we look at heterogeneity, here's where we see that those individuals um, that I showed you before, they were correlated with less willing to give up rights when you interact being high health risk and in a hot spot with being economically vulnerable, being unemployed in the United States, being non-white, uh, we see that those individuals are actually less responsive. And we can think about um, you know, whether, whether in some sense civil liberties is kind of a luxury good uh, that some people don't actually have a firm substitute for, and so it, it's more meaningful for them. That's one interpretation of those heterogeneous results by demographic background, uh, but it's something to think about um, for sure in, in future work. Okay, so moving on to the experimental treatment. So this survey um, had a demographics module. This is from our civil liberties instrument uh, where we elicited information on people's demographic uh, background, their gender, age, uh, occupation, etc. Then we have health module. We've seen that we leveraged that in order to make the Mathematica risk index where we asked about pre-existing conditions, their self-assessed likelihood of infection, and how much COVID was in their own region. Um, we had then three different arms, a health treatment, a control arm, and a civil liberties treatment. Um, and I'll describe each of these treatments in turn. So these treatments consisted of information that we randomly provided to some individuals about um, either the health effects of COVID and why in some rationale for some of the uh, sort of flattening the curve, the types of interventions that governments were taking, or a civil liberties treatment, which was the opposite of that, which just gave some information about what was being done, particularly in China and South Korea, to quell the epidemic and particularly some drastic more extreme measures that were being taken in China at the time. And some information about how um, civil liberties can be eroded during times of crisis and not necessarily restored 
Um, then we look at, and then there was a placebo group that received neither of those um, shocks of information. Then we had a first stage, which basically just assessed whether people understood the information. And finally, we looked at our outcomes. And here, um, in the interest of time, I didn't show the live stage questions before. Here, I'll show you all of the questions. You can see all of them. So what was the goal of the health information shock? The goal of the health information shock. Um, Erica, should I pause for these? Uh, sure, we can take a couple questions if you want to pause for a second. Um, the first question is asking if you have thought about replicating the study in Latin America. I think that would be, that would have been great, yes. And if we, we currently have some um, grants in to obtain additional funding in order to do that, so that's a great question. Uh, um, another question asking how you selected the people, was it in collaboration with national institutions or otherwise? So we use, that's a good question, we used um, a survey company that has uh, a very international presence. Um, and we just, uh, we did however use um, national data sets in terms of censuses and other um, employment surveys in order to make sure that our quotas were reflective of the population. Right. Uh, another question, were the definitions of civil liberties provided during the surveys? Because many people don't actually know what their civil liberties are. That's a good question. So we, we didn't provide a definition, but we tried to give specific instances. Like, for example, we didn't say, would you be willing to give up the right to movement? We said, you know, how willing are you to support a policy that would restrict um, your ability to go outside the home? Um, we didn't ask necessarily about a free press, we would say, you know, do you support the government taking over the media um, in order to harmonize information during the pandemic? So we, we tried to be really clear um, about what specific um, right that we were infringing on by just describing it outright. Great. And last one, uh, how do you think people will respond if the government compelled citizens to be vaccinated with an experimental drug? Well, you know, let's, if that's a great, that's a very good question. Um, so why don't we revisit that when we look at the dynamics? Um, I think it's, I think it's very, very interesting. From what we've seen so far, I would say that it would vary quite a bit based on both country as well as sociodemographic characteristics. Do you want to continue on and then we can collect a few more for? Yeah, these are great. These are okay. extremely great, great questions. Um, and it's so nice to have an international audience that thinks about things from different perspectives. Um, so the, the health treatment was the goal of it was to highlight the potential for public health interventions to save lives. So one of the things that we think individuals, including economists, really grapple with understanding is just exponential spread, how fast that works. So we tried to take people through, you know, what it means to exponentially spread uh, a virus. And we can try to uh, communicate what flattening the curve meant, and again, in layman's terms, um, and the supply side constraints that would come along with unchecked exponential spread. We included photos of overcrowded hospitals, mostly at the time those were coming from Spain and Italy, and the possibility of dying alone, which we thought was really resonates with a lot of individuals and um, worrying about, about losing a loved one or dying uh, without anyone around them. Lastly, we discussed the quote unquote endogeneity of the epidemic curve and the ability all citizens have to flatten it through public health mess messages. Importantly, we did not provide any information about how COVID is transmitted or the symptoms or anything like that. That was not uh, that was not the goal of this intervention. And that's important because we'll use that as a as sort of a placebo test to make sure people understood what we were telling them and not necessarily things, uh, other things. 
So this was actually an animated treatment. It was translated into every single country that we were in. Um, and so these, these links would start to, uh, to, to become, um, would become colored uh, as, the, as the virus sort of spread. And then uh, we interrupted them. So this person was tested, made to isolate, had, were traced. This person stayed home when, when sick. Um, this person followed government guidelines for hygiene. This shutdown of schools prevented this child from infecting others. So that was the sort of provided some rationale. Um, and we, uh, let's see if this link works. We also um, we also had basically an animated curve that flattened as well. Um, the civil liberties treatment, the goal was to highlight the potential for public health interventions and this crisis more generally to lead to persistent rights infringements. So we showed the epidemic curves in China and South Korea. We described the policies the two countries enacted, including aggressive stay-at-home orders, door-to-door -door temperature screens, in China, forcible quarantine, use of personal GPS to track people in South Korea, and in some cases, unfortunately, the revelation of personal information of individuals who had contracted COVID. And again, we highlighted how uh, this has been pretext for erosion uh, in the long run in other instances. So, uh, so we had a situation like this where we discussed that we're facing perhaps the biggest consequences for our generation and how Although we have to act quickly and decisively, we should also be wary of the long-term consequences of our actions. Okay, so those were the two information shocks and how we'll look at, now we've kind of transposed this table. Um, so here are the outcomes and here is the coefficient on civil liberties, the coefficient on health treatment, Again, we're using the gap between China and the United States as a benchmark. And this is the quote unquote first stage, basically trying to see whether people were paying attention to the information at all. So for the civil liberties treatment, we showed them the epidemic curve of China and showed them how it had reduced greatly um, through some of these measures and then went on to describe the measures themselves and, and how some of them include, included forcible quarantine. So amongst those who received the civil liberties treatment, they ranked China high in terms of their ability to control the response. That's very uh, reasonable given that we, we told them China had controlled their response, uh, controlled the pandemic in the, in the, in the short run. Uh, those who saw the civil liberties treatment were also worried their information could be misused later. That was also extremely predictable given that that's what we highlighted. Um, those who were shown the public health treatment, on the other hand, were much more likely to think flattening the curve was important and were much more likely to be worried about insufficient uh, PPE or personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. And then we, we might have primed people a little bit about the COVID spread, um, but overall, we didn't say anything about COVID spread um, or COVID symptom knowledge. And so we generally don't see any. Um, any uh, strong differences between the two groups here. So that's just like basically, were people paying attention to what we were saying? So now we can look at the actual results. So I'll go out through, um, maybe I'll look, take, take a few more questions here. So under, yeah, do you wanna read them, Erica? Would that be okay? Sure, so I'm gonna compile a couple of them because there's a couple questions around replication. So yeah. um, a question about replicating the study in African countries where the numbers haven't been as high, um, but also replicating it again, um, portions of the study again, since we see that um, masks are now uh, uh, being seen as an infringement of civil liberties in certain portions of the country. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, extremely, um, that's extremely interesting. Um, Yes, uh, when I come to dynamics, we'll see some of what's been happening more recently. That's the last portion, but um, but I think it would be very interesting to look at a uh, at a country in Africa. Um, I mean, Africa. There's obviously a lot of heterogeneity there too, 
but in terms of just rural and urban areas, et cetera, um, and, and also looking across uh, different locations where there's been more or less stringent government re response. Um, okay, so here we see um, when we when we shock people with information about th forcing them to think a little bit about um, the potential for long-term erosion of civil liberties, we actually see that they're less inclined to give up their rights. Um, and it's extremely interesting that we see that the coefficient is nearly the same for give up own rights and others' rights are slightly more, uh, uh, in fact, slightly less willing to give up other rights as well. Um, and so, this is actually moving them, this is actually putting a, a bit of a gap between, for example, the US and China. So the civil liberties treatment effect makes people a tenth of a standard deviation less willing to give up rights overall. This is this Z score is a combination of uh, summary statistics of both of them overall. And that corresponds to about one seventh of the difference between US and China. So it's interesting that we don't see that giving people health information doesn't make them more willing to give up rights. And we think this is because we already have people um, kind of the background here is that there are a lot of people that have information already about the, the reasons for the public health treatments and that this isn't really shocking their own risk per se. Um, this is more talking about um, the the rationale for uh, for public health interventions more broadly. When we look at uh, tracking people and uh, tracking everyone, we see that uh, the civil liberties treatment increases the minimum. So the number of lives needed to be saved in order for you to track sick people or track everyone actually is higher, so that minimum is higher, so that indicating less support for that policy. Um, shocking people with the public health treatment makes them uh, drop that minimum. They're more supportive of the policy. The health treatment also makes people more willing to download the privacy app, the MIT app on, uh, on tracking people's health uh, symptoms and their locations. And again, uh, that overall corresponds to 1 15th of the difference between the US and China. And the health treatment effect is the opposite direction and similar in magnitude. Interestingly, the health treatment kind of across the board makes people want to defer to strong leaders, delegate to experts, et cetera. Um, in general, civil liberties makes them less willing to do so, but these results are fairly weak. Um, and we have a slightly larger magnitude overall here for the health treatment. We, in the interest of time, didn't put all of the effects here, but we see similar results in terms of civil liberties making people uh, the civil liberty treatment making people less willing to trade off uh, mobility rights and business closures and democratic procedures and the health treatment, public health treatment, making them slightly more worried, uh, willing. So what we see over time, and this is using this consumer tracker survey, is that um, over time, this is within the first month of um, the first case, People are extremely, you know, potentially they're anxious and they're willing to sacrifice rights. And that starts to fall. That willingness falls over time um, since the first case. This is the coefficient on being in a hot spot and time since the first case. And we can see that overall, that does indeed start to fall over time. In general, over time, this is now going from March to June we see that people's and the, the baseline coefficient is during March. So all of these are compared to the first moment in time where we started to measure it. And we see that there's less willing to sacrifice own rights, um, relax privacy um, protections, 
So this might indicate that there is some fatigue going on over time as this pandemic marches on. Um, that people are less willing compared to the very first moment that we measured um, to sacrifice these rights over time. And this is through, across all countries. And this corresponds to becoming, to people becoming slightly less worried about their personal health risk from infection, um, and also slightly less worried about their household financial risk, but slightly more worried about the erosion of civil liberties. Interestingly though, if we look at people who still think they are at high risk of the infection, so although in general the trend is downward for both willingness to sacrifice own rights and willingness to uh, and and fear about their own health with respect to this virus there are still people even today who feel like they're at higher risk than their peers of contracting the virus and uh, those people tend to be still today the ones who are more willing to sacrifice their rights so we've got two downward trends and overall the elasticity between willingness to sacrifice rights and health is actually flat. So this, this seems to suggest there's something kind of more fundamental about this trade-off between civil liberties and health. Even though over time it's declining in the population as a whole, those individuals who feel most at risk are still the ones that are willing, more willing than others, to give things up. Okay, so we'll leave with this um, quote that, you know, decisions people take now can shape politics and the economy and culture for years to come. And what we found both descriptively, just correlationally, quasi-experimentally and experimentally is that exposure to pandemic crises can shift citizens' preferences, at least in the short run. In particular, salient private health risks make citizens more likely to give up their civil liberties and their rights and freedoms, but reminding them of the potential for long-term erosion can make them less likely so. And with that, I'll, I'll pause for a, a, a few minutes of discussion. Uh, we've had, excuse me, a few questions come in. A uh, question about how the current study is different from the historical approach. Yes, um, I think what's interesting here is that um, I think what's really neat is to be able to study these things in real time. Um, so there has certainly been documented resistance, as I mentioned at the top of the talk, about resistance to the mask mandates um, and, and people kind of having a backlash against some of the restrictions put, put in place before. Um, it's really interesting to look at how this evolves, how people's trade-offs um, look like in real time. And it's, it's very interesting to think about, you know, really how fundamentally different are we in times of crisis um, to see different nationalities, you know, not look as different on something so fundamental, um, something enshrined in the Constitution, the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the right to free press, all of these things that are so enshrined. Um, but, uh, but during a time of crisis, um, you know, there's, they are in the utility function and they are kind of subject to the same um, uh, governing principles of the price of health is shocked and, and um, it looks like civil liberties are complementary to them is what we're seeing. I think is one way to describe these results. So it's so it's about the real time um, collection that I think is so interesting in the cross country comparisons. Um, and kind of a follow up to that: uh, if people become less willing to give up civil liberties over time, would a second lockdown in case of a, of really bad second waves be a failure and not work as well as the first one? You know, one thing that that actually so we've kind of sidestepped the normative questions here. Is it good or bad to have a lockdown? Is it good or bad to let yourself, uh, to let civil liberties be um, suspended in, or it, it, at least in some small, in some either small or large way curtailed? 
Um, but one thing that I think is um, maybe hopeful is that information does actually help. So if you give people information about either of these topics, civil liberties or the rationale for civil liberty, uh, public health uh, restrictions, you know, people can can move, are moved. And, um, and we didn't do both, which would have been an interesting thing to do. We didn't both give people the you know, the shock about potential concern as well as the rationale together, because um, that would have been interesting uh, to see as well. But it does suggest that there is scope for someone that is um, able to, um, to edify exactly the reasons for public health measures to kind of make progress um, on, on moving people's uh, views on these trade-offs. But I will say that it's a very strong result. I'm sorry it wasn't highlighted more in the slides, um, that people that are disadvantaged are, 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 you know, for me, I didn't really know which way it would go a priori, but, um, but they are very, they are, hold, they are the ones holding tightest on to these rights. And I, I think that they're, that really deserves attention. Um, both from a policy perspective and as academicians to try and understand that more. Um, we have a question wondering how the attitudes towards civil liberties compare to the attitudes held during the Spanish flu of 1918. Yes, for that, we have to really look to the, to the work of historians. Um, it's interesting uh, that um, it's interesting, so obviously there was, uh, in San Francisco, there was strong opposition to the mask mandate. Um, and, uh, but I don't think there was an attempt at that time to preserve kind of people's views uh, in the moment. Um, So I think, but the best work has been done on that has been the work of, of historians that were trying to kind of recreate uh, what people went through. Uh, and there was recent, there's actually a documentary that I recently watched where they did some really nice, maybe it's a 25, 30 year old documentary. They actually had some survivors um, that were interviewed as well. And, and just talking about, it's eerily similar actually, uh, um, regarding some of the uh, some of the policies that have were put in place then and have put it have been put in place now i think we have time for one or two more questions so do you think there's a correlation in the strength of democracy and the willingness of people to give up their civil liberties in a specific country within a given country um uh what we see most strongly is uh is again that uh, those who have uh, less financial means those who have been historically exploited are less willing to give up their civil liberties um, that's the strongest correlation we see um, interestingly we don't see a huge divide politically uh, we see that those who mistrust the media are less willing to give up their uh, civil liberties Uh, let's see. One last question. It looks like uh, so the country-specific volume of data does it have any bearing on the research? So, for example, in India, the virus spread in every state, and on the other hand, in China, it was primarily in Wuhan. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. We should look at the data, um, particularly the I think the India China. Um, divide. We should look at that carefully. Um, we haven't explored that in detail yet. Uh, 